Hey everybody, this is Ravi Svidron from IntelliHut. I am the IntelliHut Corporate Trainer. Today we are going to talk all about our heat exchanger. And what we're going to do is we're going to take various components off of the heat exchanger in a teardown process. We'll talk about each of the components. So before we start, let's talk a little bit about what we need. Really, there's not a whole lot of components that are necessary for this. We're going to take a long Phillips head screwdriver, and it's long for a reason, we'll talk about that. We're going to take a T20 screwdriver, okay, Torx screwdriver here. And then you really need a five and a half millimeter socket head. That's what's going to allow us to get that top cast plate off. I like to put it on a T-handle because it allows us to access what we need to a little bit better. So we're going to take that. A couple extra things. We're going to have a Sharpie marker. We're going to use Molly Coat Compound 111. This is a lubricant that we'll be using. And I'm also going to grab the accessory bag from inside of our front door. We're going to take that as well. All right, so I'm going to grab my long Phillips head screwdriver here. The first thing we're going to do is take the blower off of the top cast of the heat exchanger. Now on every heat exchanger you're going to see in the field, there are four Phillips head screws on the heat exchanger. Now I have my heat exchanger sitting on a table, so this is going to be really easy for me because I have easy access from the top. When you're working on this in the field, depending on what type of unit we're actually taking the blower off of, when it's inside the cabinet, it's a little bit more difficult. Now, it's important to note before we start that before you do any work on the heat exchanger or inside of the unit, we have to make sure that the unit is off. We will never recommend to you to replace any component while the unit is running. That's a safety risk. You'll note that there is a gasket here as I drop my screw on the floor. Gasket here that comes off with the blower. So this sits on, side, on top of the top cast plate. This gets compressed when we tighten the blower on. This is just a seal. So this can go on either way. If you were to ever replace a blower in the field, you actually get one of these in the replacement kit. So we're going to put that aside. We're actually going to leave the blower and gas valve assembly aside for now. We're going to take the gas valve assembly off in a second. Before we do that, we're actually going to take our top gas plate off. So this is where we're going to use our five and a half millimeter socket head. It's good to have a five and a half millimeter with you anytime you're working on one of our pieces of equipment because we use this for everything. So we're going to take these top cast screws off. T-handle helps. We're just going to work our way around. Okay. So I'm going to place that to the side. Try not to lose all my screws. You'll notice that there is a gasket on the inside here. Okay, so gasket goes on that top, ca ca top cast plate. You actually cannot reverse this gasket. So it only goes on one way. That's nice for when we put it back on. Inside this top cast plate, there's a couple things we're looking at here. Really, if you were ever doing this in the field, there'd only really be a couple of scenarios you'd be pulling this off. The first would be to check the burner which is underneath this deflector plate here. We'll pull that off in a second. The other piece would be to check these flappers. There's flappers that sit inside the top cast here. They should be sitting in the positions you see them in here now. So the job is to open and close like so. If they're laying inside the top cast, that means they need to be replaced. They've broken off their pins that hold them in place. So what we're gonna do next here, get that piece back in, is I'm going to grab that same five and a half millimeter T-handle. This is where it's helpful to actually have the T-handle. I want to take this deflector plate off. This is five and a half millimeter as well. It's really difficult to get a socket wrench into this space. Again, I've got the advantage this is hand tight for me, so I'm just gonna... It's easy to get that out. It's a lot more difficult to get it out if it drops into the burn chamber itself, so. I want to be careful about that. Okay, so now I can actually pull the burner out of the heat exchanger. Notice if you look on the inside of the burner, you'll see that there is a conical feature in there which helps to distribute our air fuel mixture through the burner. See this burner is a little bit dark in color. That's because this heat exchanger was in service before we took it apart, so you're gonna see a little bit of that discoloration here. This is where your flame establishes on the inside of your heat exchanger should also note that there is a seam that runs down the burner. We want this seam, when we replace the burner, to face 
away from our electrode. So we're gonna put our burner off to the side. So now I've pulled up a heat exchanger cutaway so we can actually see what's on the inside. It's very hard to look down into the burn chamber on video. So if we were to actually look inside the burn chamber, you'd be seeing a few things. Really what you're seeing here is ceramic. So we looked at the burner previously. Our ceramic is actually just a big thick piece of insulation which is gonna help separate our two passes of the heat exchanger. You can see the 316L stainless steel coils that are wrapped around on the inside here. What you'll also see that you don't see in this heat exchanger here is there'll be a bead of sealant that runs around the uh, interface between the coil and the piece of ceramic. Okay, so we're gonna take the electrode off next. This is a Gen 2 version 2 hex, which is what you're gonna see in the field. You notice it's got three of the same Phillips head screws that we had before. When you see this on a floor mount unit, you'll also have a ground screw that is, or a ground line in the DSI that's attached here. So again, when you're taking something off a unit, make sure you note where all the components go. We wanna make sure we put that ground wire back again on those floor mount units. Okay, so I'm going to take my screwdriver. We're gonna take this off. I'm just gonna, okay, so I'm gonna pull this out. And you'll notice right away that we've got a gasket on here. I'm gonna wiggle this guy out. So we've got a paper gasket on the bottom of the electrode. It's a good idea anytime you're pulling the electrode off to replace this paper gasket. Okay, when you get your unit, it's going to have a bag on the inside of the door. On the inside of that bag, you see we've got some paper gaskets. There are always enough replacements in here to do one change out across all your electrodes. You'll also see that this uh, sight glass here is not part of the actual electrode. So you pull the electrode off, the sight glass is remaining here. Sometimes when you pull the electrode off, this will come off with it, and that's totally fine. If you happen to lose this, there are also extras of that in the accessory bag that goes with the unit. So you always have an extra sight glass as well. The electrode itself, in our case, hasn't been used quite that much. You can see here's your electrode piece here where your spark is generated, and then you've got a flame detection sensor here, which is what routes back to your control board and proves flame inside the chamber. So if we were to pull this out, that's what you would see. We're gonna put this to the side for a second. Continuing on with our process here, we're gonna pull off our outlet elbow next. Now, if the unit is pressurized and has water in it, it's important that you drain the water before you ever remove anything on the water side. This is the heat exchanger outlet elbow that actually sits into the termination of the coil in the heat exchanger. So we have to make sure that the system has been drained before we pull this off. This is where our outlet temperature sensor is located along with our resettable thermal fuse. So this is what is going to, this is the code requirement thermal fuse that cuts us off before we get to 210 degrees. Actually, this is gonna trip somewhere around 200. You see we have a non-resettable thermal fuse that's measuring casting temperature here back behind where the outlet uh, elbow is. This is going to trigger at 394 degrees Fahrenheit. That is going to disable the heat exchanger in case there was a critical casting failure. You don't want to see 394 degrees there. This is a non-resettable switch, so there's no uh, push button to uh, reset that. So I'm going to take that T-handle from before, again, five and a half millimeter. It's a common theme. We're going to pull these two screws off. So I'm going to do that here. And I have the luxury of not having this installed in the cabinet when I'm doing this. So very easy for me to access this. Sometimes you're going to require a slightly longer extension here. This screw back here can be pretty difficult to access on some units. One tip I would have if you were doing this replacement in the field is there are times you can actually loosen this screw and remove the outlet elbow without removing the bracket. You gotta be careful you don't bend the bracket. You have to make sure you can still get a seal on this elbow when you put it back in place, but sometimes locating this hole is difficult when we're replacing. So we're gonna take that off here. And once that is off, take our bracket, move it out of the way, we can pull out our outlet elbow. We're gonna wiggle it free, and there are gonna be three O-rings. They'll be present on that elbow. You can see they're all lubricated up. That's important. We don't wanna pinch them when we put them back in place. You really wanna make sure that you've got some potable water certified lubricant on hand if you're ever replacing this or replacing the O-rings because it's really not fun to put this back on, pinch an O-ring and then have a water leak and have to take it all back off uh, once again to fix that. So just keep that in mind. 
Okay, so we got two more components we're gonna talk about that are on the heat exchanger bracket here. Again, depending on what type of unit you're installing or servicing, you may or may not see this bracket. These components are part of every heat exchanger's operation, but sometimes they're mounted somewhere else in the cabinet. Uh, this would be a wall, or I'm sorry, this would be a floor mount unit where you see these two parts mounted. This is our DSI or direct spark ignition module. It's the ignition board. It really does a few things. It's going to have the high voltage cable, which will connect to that electrode we pulled off earlier, just like a spark plug. See it like that. Okay, so it's gonna help generate a spark inside of our burn chamber. It also sends a signal to our gas valve to open when we have uh, ignition, okay? So really two five and a half millimeter hex head screws on that. Very easy to take that piece off. Below that is our air pressure switch. This is what proves that we can exhaust our exhaust gas. This has one job and one job only. This piece is making sure that we can actually push our flue gases out so there's safety in the system. There's a diaphragm on the inside which will pop open if there's too much back pressure, which will stop the heat exchanger from pushing that exhaust out. Now, this is not on the heat exchanger itself, but it is a component that you're gonna see in practice. This is our flow sensor, flow valve, depending on who you're talking to, we call it different things. Uh, it's manufactured by Time Engineering, so it's a valve from them. Essentially, this valve does a number of things. It's what open and closes flow to our heat exchanger coils. So each individual heat exchanger is going to have one of these. It also has a inlet temperature sensor on it and a flow sensor to directly measure our flow rate. So you'll see that on the unit. Actually does a fourth thing if your unit has temperature priority. It can actually work as a stepper motor to allow different amounts of flow rate into your heat exchanger. Okay, so we're not done quite yet. We actually have that gas valve blower assembly that we pulled off of the heat exchanger earlier. And we can actually take the gas valve off of the blower assembly here. Now, if you look at the top of this, there's a lot of screws here that we actually don't have to touch at all. So we're going to not touch those and we're just gonna deal with the ones that are relevant. There's actually three T20 screws that we are going to take off. Before we do that, in order to make it easier when we're trying to put this back on, See, there's a little peg that's located right here. You see, I've already marked it with Sharpie. I like to circle this with a bit of Sharpie, just mark it up so that you are familiar with where that peg hole is located on this plate here. Because when we put the gas valve back on, or if we were replacing the gas valve, that's gonna be relevant so that we know what we're doing. I rotate it back towards me. I'm gonna get my T20. We're finally gonna grab that. And we're going to loosen up those three screws that we indicated. Okay, so we're gonna pull those off. One over here. I'm gonna support it with one hand or it's gonna to wanna to jump off on me. And this guy here. Okay, and our gas valve is going to lift right off. Now, you'll notice that the swirl plate underneath comes right off of the adapter plate here as well. And the reason we marked our hole on our gas valve is because if you take this off and you're not paying attention, you can actually line up these three holes in a number of different ways. So in order to remember which way to put it back on, if we were going to go replace our gas valve, put the gas valve back on, we would want to locate that peg we marked previously the hole where the peg goes, we can put our peg into that hole. In fact, I'm going to remove the screws here to make it a little bit easier to demonstrate here. Get those out of the way. Put our peg back through that hole and you can see that the, well maybe you can't see, but I can see that the holes line up real nicely. Now, there's also an arrow on our gas valve which points down. So we know that the peg goes into the marked hole and that the arrow points straight down and that's going to allow us to line up which way to put the gas valve back on. Cool. And just like that, it's all back together. Wasn't that easy? Leave a comment on what you want to see in the next video and uh, thanks for joining us.